Good evening, uh, everyone. It's a privilege to be a part of this important conversation here at Stanford tonight, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to speak with you for a few minutes tonight on the problem of gun violence and mental illness and how we understand that problem in the context of all of the other complex causes of violence in our society and what such an understanding might imply for the challenging task of, of devising and implementing better policies and laws and interventions uh, to reduce gun violence in people with mental illness, but uh, laws and policies that will be not only effective but fair, uh, that will um, uh, really uh, get at the problem but avoid reinforcing uh, the idea in the public mind that everybody with mental illness is dangerous and uh, to be avoided, and uh, you know, which is not only uh, inaccurate but harmful to people recovering from mental illness. Uh, you know, who were the subject of lots of discrimination. Um, you know, if you learned everything you knew about schizophrenia by watching nighttime television in the United States, you'd think everybody with mental illness is a homicidal maniac. And so how do we talk about this problem without reinforcing that um, really uh, harmful stereotype? Um, how do we balance uh, the competing concerns of public safety and civil rights and, uh, and I appreciate the chance to, to talk with you about that uh, tonight. Let me start with a big picture on gun violence. I imagine that uh, all of you have at uh, some time in your life been to our uh, National Mall and you've seen, um, you know, what a sobering uh, thing it is to contemplate 58,000 names carved uh, on a granite wall on the earth, and that's the number of United States military personnel who died uh, during roughly a 10-year period of time in the Vietnam War. But let me ask you, what if we were to build a monument to commemorate, to remember all of the people in the United States who have died in the last 10 years as a result of a gunshot? We would need a monument five times larger than the Vietnam Memorial. 306,946 people have died as a result of a gunshot. And I show you that not only to give you a sense of the magnitude of this problem, this tragedy, but also this. It turns out 39% of those deaths were victims of a homicide. 57%, the majority, were suicides, people who died at their own hand using a firearm. 4% were other situations, law enforcement action or accidents. Now, I've done some calculations and figured that if we were to reduce the portion of that risk that really has to do with mental illness, we might reduce it by about 100,000. But 95% of that reduction would be from reducing suicide. Very little of it would come from reducing homicide because homicide is a problem that um, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with mental illness. Uh, there are three ways of thinking about risk of violent behavior in relationship to mental illness. One is uh, what you might call absolute risk. That's just the proportion of people with mental illness who are likely to commit some kind of violent act, a minor or serious uh, act of violence in a year. And that's 7%. Uh, that's factoring out the, uh, the risk that might be associated with substance abuse, just so that we can think about mental illness uh, per se, people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or serious uh, depression serious mental illness, 7% would do something violent in a year, but the vast majority do not, are not violent. The second way of thinking about risk is in the comparative context of relative risk, comparing people with mental illness to people who don't have mental illness. And it turns out there, people with serious mental illness are about three times more likely to uh, engage in some violent behavior than people without mental illness. And now the third way of thinking about risk is to ask the question, what is the proportional contribution to the overall problem of violence that is attributable to um, mental illness? And um, the answer to that question is about 4%. That is to say, if we were to reduce the risk of violence in people with mental illness, not to zero, but to what it is for people without serious mental illness, how much would violence uh, towards other people go down overall in the population? About 4%. Um, the reason is that most people with mental illness aren't violent, and there aren't that many people with serious mental illness uh, in the population. So, you know, um, it isn't to say that there's no link at all. There is. But it's a modest link, and it's a, not a big contribution uh, from one risk factor. It's not the place you'd start if you said, well, how are we going to reduce violence in society? 
Now, when we turn to suicide, there's a different answer to that question. The link between suicide and mental illness is much stronger. Mental illness contributes a great deal to the risk of suicide. On average, 26% of the suicide rate in males is, uh, is, is attributable to a mental illness such as depression or bipolar disorder. In females, it's 32%, but some studies have, have found as high as 67%. And these are treatable illnesses. It means if people got good treatment in a timely way that we could uh, reduce the risk of suicide and therefore cut down the gun violence uh, death toll by a great deal. What is the link between mental illness and violence? Well, you know, the answer to that question is it depends. It depends on what we mean by mental illness, what we mean by violence, and, you know, what we mean by the relationship between the two. And also, you know, where are we standing when we study it? Um, here is an interesting uh, display of the average um, prevalence of violent behavior in people with mental illness, sorted out by the setting in which it has been studied. And if you look at this uh, over there on the left uh, of this um, figure, uh, outpatients in treatment, stable outpatients in treatment, about 8% in a year would do something um, violent towards another person. As you move over to representative community samples, some of whom are in treatment, some not, it's a little bit higher, discharged inpatients, people who've been in the hospital, um, you know, at a time when uh, they've had a mental health crisis, maybe they, uh, you know, were uh, threatening towards others or themselves, it's a little bit higher, 13%. When you get to patients who present in emergency departments, it's 23%. Involuntarily committed patients, you know, what percentage of them during the lead-up to their involuntary commitment were violent? Uh, 36%. This is just violence towards others. Uh, and first episode psychosis patients, these are people who present for the first time with a, with a psychotic illness like schizophrenia, and that's the highest of all. That's interesting because, you know, one of our core policies in terms of trying to keep guns out of the hands of people uh, in a mental health crisis is to search for records of a legally uh, disqualifying mental health uh, adjudication, and these are people who have never touched the system. There might not be any record at all. You know, so that as a strategy is just not going to work very well for people who are untreated and, uh, you know, don't have any contact with, with the system. The other thing is that these settings, uh, these studies that are averaged here, uh, they don't necessarily represent different populations. They could be the same people at different moments, different stages in their, in their illness and treatment uh, career. So if you have a strategy that is focused on one phase, uh, you know, the people who've been in the hospital uh, this month might be very stable people, uh, not at risk of any uh, violent behavior, uh, you know, two or three years from now. How do we reduce gun violence in people with mental illness? Well, you know, I wish we could do what our, some of our peer countries do, like, you know, Japan or um, other, other countries, um, and that is to, uh, is to legally limit uh, firearms just you know limit broadly the access uh, that people have to guns I mean you know it's just too dangerous we can't do that because uh, the Second Amendment to the Constitution as interpreted recently by the United States Supreme Court confers uh, a right uh, 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 that people have here to uh, to uh, purchase and possess uh, firearms um, so you know we might have a gun violence problem we can't solve it uh, by uh, getting rid of the uh, of the guns, of which we have 300 million in this country. We have to do something a little bit different. Uh, we have to think about dangerous people and how we identify and try to uh, limit access to guns for people considered to be a, a risk uh, to others or themselves. That's hard to do because violence is complicated, people are complicated. Um, so what are the other approaches? Well, there's one I like to call the clinical legal approach. That is, you know, we assess risk, we identify people who meet certain criteria, we confine them, we commit them to the hospital, you know, using the uh, involuntary commitment laws that we prohibit persons at risk uh, from having guns, um, you know, using background checks. And, um, and this, you know, assumes that clinicians uh, are able to, you know, predict uh, who's going to be violent. And... Um, they're not very good at doing that, you know, I mean, particularly uh, positive uh, predictions of risk. They're a little bit better at ruling out who's not going to be violent. Um, so um, what's the other approach? Well, the other approach I might call the social therapeutic approach, and that is to say, let's, you know, we can't predict who's going to be violent. Let's prevent the unpredicted. Let's get upstream and think about 
what are the risk factors for poor mental health outcomes over the life course? Uh, let's think about trauma and substance abuse, and let's address the social and economic um, uh, determinants of violence. You know, think about how to have healthy communities, and you know, uh, the, with less uh, poverty and, and inequality, and uh, where where uh, you know people have a better quality of life, and um, and when put people do uh, have mental illness, let's provide effective evidence-based treatment, uh, you know, knowing what we know about this. Um, and let's not have so many people out there with untreated mental illness uh, because um, they can't pay for it or, um, or, or we don't care. Um, now, the law, you know, as a, you know, one part of this problem, I mean, it's, or, or this solution, uh, the federal law categorically excludes some people with mental illness from accessing firearms. This is a legacy of the 1968 Gun Control Act, you know, that was passed after uh, Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King were assassinated. Um, and uh, basically there's two parts of it. Uh, people who have been committed to a mental institution, um, and the thinking there is people who have been, you know, ill enough or impaired enough to require uh, involuntary inpatient treatment um, and uh, have had their right to refuse treatment uh, overridden have been confined. They should not have access to firearms. And uh, by the way, part of the reason for that is uh, not only that, uh, you know, there's this presumption that they um, might be uh, incapacitated or dangerous, but that they've been afforded the uh, legal due process protections for that deprivation of liberty, which is then sort of leverage to take away their firearm rights. Um, there's another prong to this is the language adjudicated as a mental defective, which doesn't really, you know, mean anything uh, uh, clinically. Legally, it means someone has been uh, subject to a, to a legal authority, a judicial proceeding where they've been found because of mental illness to be dangerous or in, in, incompetent to manage their own affairs, uh, or in a criminal matter, um, incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, and those, uh, that definition has been passed down through the Brady Law from the 1990s, uh, which spawned the National Instant Criminal Background Check System that some states for a while reported to, and now more states are reporting uh, their records to it uh, after the uh, National Instant Check System Improvement Act. Um, so the question is, you know, can, can these uh, laws, this definition, um, keep guns out of the hands of people like this? You know, we're all concerned about these mass shootings, and it's kind of a weird prism, you know, through which to view this problem because people like Jared Loeffner, uh, you know, and... Um, Adam Lanza are not only very atypical of, uh, of uh, perpetrators of gun violence, but they're also very atypical of people with mental illness. Um, but it's why we're having this conversation. Um, so, you know, can the laws keep guns out of the hands of people like that when people with mental illness look like this? They look like everyone in this room. They have the full range of risk factors, of protective factors for violence. Um, as anyone else does, um, you know, when someone with mental illness uh, engages in aggressive or violent behavior, it's not always because of their mental illness. Um, you know, they range from your harmless grandmother to your n uh, neighbor's not so harmless intoxicated boyfriend and everything in between. Um, so do background checks work? Well, you know, there are a lot of reasons why they might not work. There's very little research that has actually asked that question. And here are the results uh, from a study that our group has conducted in Connecticut. And here you see a picture, um, you know, of, and what this uh, displays, this picture is the uh, average monthly risk of violent crime in two groups of people, people with serious mental illness who have been disqualified from firearms and those who have not because they have been voluntarily admitted to the hospital. And you see that uh, crime is going down a little bit over the years in the early 2000s, and, and something happens there in 2007. And what happened there is that Connecticut began reporting uh, mental health records to the National Instant Check System. So before that time, uh, the law was not enforced after it was, and you can see that there is a uh, significant impact there that one could attribute to that policy. But let's put that in perspective. It turns out that only 7% of the people with serious mental illness in the public uh, mental health system in Connecticut uh, were disqualified on the basis of their mental health background. A larger group were disqualified because of their criminal background. Um, and there was a little group that, that uh, overlapped, 
So what that means is that, yes, there was a significant effect, but it didn't affect many people. It's a sort of a, you know, a solution on the margins. It, um, we estimate, prevented an estimated of 14 violent crimes uh, per year. Uh, but overall, it had less than a 1% uh, reduction um, of, of violent crime. Um, in the end, maybe it really is about the guns and not the mental illness. This is a scatter plot showing um, on one axis state gun law restrictiveness. How restrictive are gun laws in each state? And <clears throat> what you can see is the states with more restrictive gun laws have um, lower fatality rates due to firearms. That's a significant linear correlation. Um, but another factor that actually increases the risk of uh, violence even more at the state level is just the household gun ownership rate. How many people are there, how many households uh, are there as a proportion of all the households where there are guns lying around? If you put those two variables together, it turns out that you know, the level of saturation of guns in a state has an impact on the relationship between law and death. So if the laws are more restrictive, in states that don't have a lot of guns to begin with, that has a deterrent effect. Uh, in states that uh, are really saturated with guns, where over 50 or 60 percent of the households have guns anyway, you know, the laws have less of an effect. Um, so I think that um, is important for thinking about where we go from here. Um, there are a number of uh, policy approaches to reduce gun violence at the state level, and I hope we can talk about them in the discussion period uh, that, that follows. What about the idea of having mental health clinicians report people that are posing a risk of, uh, of harming themselves or others to the police? That's an idea that New York has tried. Will that keep people from uh, seeking treatment, and will it inhibit people's disclosures and therapy? Um, Will it over-identify uh, people who are really not at risk? Or, you know, will it, um, you know, help to prevent people from ha access to lethal means? What about mandated outpatient treatment? You know, is that a solution to gun violence? And some people think it is. Um, what about expanding the categories of mental health gun disqualification? What about people who are voluntarily ad admitted to hospital? Um, how about the idea of uh, seizing guns from people who are uh, determined to be dangerous, irrespective of whether they have mental illness? Um, and what about investing in the mental health system? You know, uh, the majority of adults in this country now uh, support the idea of increasing spending uh, for screening and better mental health treatment as a strategy to reduce gun violence. Lots of stakeholders in the mental health field are ambivalent about that connection. On the one hand, yes. We've been talking for years about having a better mental health care system, one that's less fragmented and more responsive and more effective and, and uh, you know, delivers treatment to people. There's just lots of people out there, uh, there who uh, have untreated mental illness, and uh, we need a better, uh, better system. Um, at the same time, we don't like the idea of, um, of, of premising mental health system reform on reducing gun violence. Um, so. Um, how, how do we think carefully about um, these policies? And in my view, it's not just one thing. Uh, this is a complex, multi-determined problem that requires a, an equally comprehensive solution. Thank you very much.